Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday morning, and you know what that means. It's time for Thursday morning Bible study with coffee. So I got it right here. It's delicious. It's the Burger King coffee. Mm. Ah. Hey, you know, guess what? They have a new Burger King sandwich now. It's true. It's, um, the sausage is actually made out of plants. It's kind of like that, what do they call it? The amazing burger or the, the uh, amazing soy burger. I know they don't say soy. They call it the incredible burger. It's one of those kind of superlatives or whatever, is it, you know, over the top. The, the incredible gargantuan burger or something. I don't know what it's called. But anyway, they have one now that imitates plants and stuff. And it imitates uh, meat for sausage for a breakfast sandwich. Because really, that's about the only thing I like at, at Burger King. I like the coffee. Just waiting till more of you come on right now, by the way. Uh, so that's why I'm talking about Burger King. But but I like the breakfast sandwiches. Yeah, I do. And um, and they have this one now where, like I said, you're just eating. So I feel like like it's like I'm having a salad now when I eat a, a breakfast sandwich from Burger King. I mean, it's made out of plants, right? So that's got to be at least part of my daily something or other for uh, for vegetables, right? Do I get do I get credit for that or something? I hope so. Well, praise God. I'm assuming a fair amount of you are now online to watch the Thursday morning Bible study. Right now, the plan for next Thursday is for us to meet in person again. And if you're not comfortable with that, that's okay. I'm going to see if I can try to figure out a way to live stream our actual live in-person video. I'm going to try to do that. So for those of you that are still kind of uncomfortable, totally get it. And you don't want to come to that Thursday morning Bible study, but you want to, you want to come, but you just want to, you want to attend uh, via the internet. I think that that would be just fine. So I'm going to try to find a way to do that where I can set up the, the camera where you can hear me and you can hear the rest of the things that are going on. And, uh, and so you can attend even if you don't feel comfortable in attending in person. If you do uh, come in person here uh, this next Thursday, a week from today, uh, at 10 o'clock at our normal time, um, just know that we're going we're gonna to practice the whole social distancing thing. We're going to be smart about that and kind of sit a little farther apart from each other. Maybe I'll get a microphone or something, or who knows, maybe we will even set up in the sanctuary so I have a microphone so I don't have to yell to, to, uh, for everybody to hear me. And so we'll just try to do that. We can still have our coffee and treats or something if we want to, but we'll just sit a little, a little further away from each other than we normally do. But I think it will be great for us to get back together. And um, so with that, let's pray and we will we'll have our Bible study today. Father, I thank you for this beautiful day. And I ask in the name of Jesus that you bless our time in your word. I pray for everyone watching today that whatever their needs are, you'll minister to them and you'll meet their needs according to your riches and glory. I thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your constant grace and your goodness. We trust in you, bless you, and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. We're still in the book of John, and we're in John chapter 7, and we quit at about verse 24. So we're starting in verse 25 today. Again, John chapter 7, verse 25. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? Talking about Jesus. But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? So remember what we read last time, that even Jesus' brothers, and he had at least four of them, uh, did not believe in him. And they were kind of, as it seems like they were, at least at that point in time, as mean as the brothers were to Joseph, who was the favored son in the Old Testament. Talking about Joseph, the, the youngest or almost youngest son of Jacob, who had the multicolored coat and had this great, amazing destiny and was what the Jews call a tzaddik, which means he was he was just amazingly righteous. And you can't really find hardly any time that Joseph 
overtly sins that's uh, that's listed in the scripture. Maybe when he was toying with his brothers who had it coming, by the way, after he becomes the second in charge in Egypt and and he looks like an Egyptian and, and so he fools his brothers who were so mean to him that were about to kill him. And then if it weren't for Judah standing up and saying, uh, no, let's not kill him. Let's sell him. Let's make some money off the deal here. Sell him to some Ishmaelites as a slave. And then maybe they'll kill him. No big deal. Uh, but he ultimately is sold into slavery in Egypt. And then the rest is history. And he remains faithful to the Lord all that time. Even in difficult circumstances, he still says things like, how can I do this thing in the sight of my God? When he could have easily sinned and uh, just went in Egypt, do as the Egyptians do, he didn't. And he stayed faithful to the Lord. The Lord promoted him. And when he was there with his mean brothers that had to come and grovel before him, just like the vision that he had so many years before foretold, um, he did toy with them a little bit. But, you know, he wanted to see his brother Benjamin. They had the same mom. You know, Jacob had four wives. And so there were, it's complex. But other than that, you really don't see Joseph sinning that much. So he is a type of Christ. Remember how we talked about uh, the typos or the, the tupas that are in Scripture? They're like these little impressions in the Old Testament that remind us about, um, or not remind us, but really foreshadow who Jesus was to be, who the Messiah was to be, some of his characteristics, what he was all about, and what he would be in the future. And Joseph is one of those things, one of those two passes. He embodies the, the, the seeming righteousness, obviously, of, of Jesus, kind of foreshadows that, um, seems to foreshadow being um, going through terrible uh, accusations, having an amazing destiny that people did not want to listen to, um, being mistreated by your own brothers. All of those things uh, should come to our mind when we read a passage like this in John chapter 7 that says that Jesus' own brothers didn't even believe in him. And in this instance, they're saying, hey, why don't you go up to the feast? Because they know that it, the potential exists for him to get beaten up really bad and even killed. So to that extent, right away, we draw a straight line between these brothers of Jesus and the brothers of Joseph, the the dreamer, who were willing to kill him, who were willing to uh, try to squash his dream. And uh, these brothers apparently are sick of whatever it is they perceive Jesus, their brother Yeshua, is called to do and to be. And they're jealous also. Um, that is the root cause of so much of the, of the wars uh, in this world. That's what James says in his book. Where do wars and quarrels and, and fightings come uh, among you, brothers, he's talking to Christians, but he's speaking in a general way. He says that don't they come from your lusts that war in your members? You lust because, you know, you have not. And so you lust and then you kill in order to get what you don't have. So it's all kind of wrapped up in envy, even envy of someone's relationship with God. Surprisingly, people will kill for this. And, um, and it's happened for millennia. And in this instance, Jesus was not immune to this either. So he knows what it feels like to be rejected by his own family. Some of you maybe have had that experience too. You got saved and your family did not understand and they've been mean to you. And you're thinking, hey, well, I'm just trying to be a good Christian. I don't understand why people are mean to me. What's up with that? Well, you're in good company. And Jesus even said, if they persecute you, just know they persecuted me first. So, um, so this does validate the fact that the brothers were telling the truth uh, when they were conspiring to see Jesus go up and get beaten up and even killed at this, um, at this feast. Nice brothers, huh? But the people are, are speaking. They're saying, well, you know, what's interesting is um, it looks like he's not, he's not, they're not attacking him and they're not arresting him. So what's the deal? Maybe the rulers have changed their mind. Maybe the Jewish Leaders think that he really is the Christ. Verse 27 says, however, oh, what is that? Someone is, someone is texting me, sorry. I wish they texted me this way so I could read it and it wasn't so small. I need that older people's font <laughs> so I can read it. Oh man, otherwise I'm doing this old person thing. Oh, I hate that, but I'm, but I do that now. I still feel young when I'm sitting down. <laughs> uh, let's have some coffee, shall we? Mm. Okay. 
Back to scripture here. However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. So people are talking, and this is John recording all the conversations that he's hearing that are going on while he's there with Jesus and helping him with his ministry. And Jesus is teaching in this area, and, uh, and he's listening, and he's hearing people's conversations, as I said. And uh, this reveals one of the common misconceptions that people had at this time, that the Messiah somehow was going to come out of nowhere, that you wouldn't, there would be no prophecy about the fact that he'd be born in Bethlehem and that he would be called a Nazarene and, you know, go down the line, all the things that were predicted about Jesus hundreds of years beforehand. Some people didn't know that, and they had a different concept of what the Messiah was going to be, and they thought that he would just kind of show up out of nowhere. And so that's what that was this conversation that John overheard. <clears throat> and he says, you know, we actually know this guy. We know he's from Nazareth. We a lot of our people, you know, grew up with him. We know, we know him. This is Yeshua from Nazareth. This is the carpenter's son. This is the guy, presumably, that's going to take over his carpenter's uh, dad's, um, who probably was dead by this point, uh, shop. That's probably what he's going to do, but he's really smart. And my goodness, he doesn't ever seem to make any mistakes. And uh, he's really a holy man, very devout. But we know him. So the fact that he's familiar to us means that he, he can't possibly be the one that God sent. After all, he was a baby at one point, and he grew to be a teenager. And some of us remember when he was in the temple when he was 12 years old, and he was, and he was talking, and we were pretty amazed. We thought for sure he was going to get on the fast track to being a rabbi. But for whatever reason, he went back and he worked in the carpenter shop. So I guess it just didn't work out. But now all of a sudden, he's teaching, he's preaching. He didn't go to any of the rabbinic schools that we're familiar with. Why is he out here? We don't know, but we know him. So he can't be the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come in on a white horse, right? From somewhere we don't know. Verse 28, then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, you both know me and you know where I, for I'm from. So again, Jesus knew the hearts of people and what people were whispering while he was teaching, he perceived uh, in his heart and his spirit and he knew. And so he just used that in his sermon and he, and he spoke it out. I have not come of myself, but he who has sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Things they did not understand. Talking about his relationship with the Father, even before he was incarnate, before the Word became flesh here on this planet. He was face to face with the Father, and always was one with the Father, one with the Spirit. He's trying to talk about the things that are inexpressible. And of course, <coughs> we're still trying to figure this out ourselves, aren't we? Therefore, they sought to take him. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. So there were some times that Jesus was called to kind of slip away and run away when danger was coming. And other times the angels or just the providence of, of Almighty God, the Father, kept him safe, shielded him, was a shelter to him. And so uh, it, that's, that's, there's application there for us. Sometimes we can trust God in the midst of the storm or when we're walking through the valley. And other times the Lord tells us to run. Flee to the hills, right? Don't stay in Jerusalem because uh, there's not going to be one stone left upon another. So run. Sometimes God says run. Sometimes he says stand. Having done all to stand, stand therefore with, your, with the full armor of God on. And, um, and the shield of faith is going to quench every fiery dart of, those en of the enemy. So different times... Uh, require different kinds of responses. And the same Holy Spirit can give us either a green light to go forward, or he can give us a caution, or he can give us a red light, or he can say, don't go this way, go that way. And we see it reflected in the book of Acts and the life of the apostles who were on their way to preach the gospel to anyone who would listen. And then they would perceive the Holy Spirit says, don't go this way. So they'd have to go. Then they'd butt up against another boundary and the Holy Spirit, no, 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 don't come here. And then they'd go again, right? Until finally they get a dream or a vision or a revelation. Oh, this is, this is the green light. Go this way. So in this instance, Jesus in this moment was called sovereignly by the Father to just stay right where he was. And he was protected in that moment. Therefore, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? 
So it's possible to believe in Jesus, but not to believe in him in an accurate way or to, to know exactly who he is and to acknowledge him for who he is. You know, the Bible says that, hey, you believe, uh, you believe in God? You know, that's exciting. You know, the, the demons believe also and they tremble. Um, so believing that Jesus existed, believing that he taught good messages or even that he's unparalleled in, in, as a teacher, as a philosopher or however you want to talk to, about him, that's not enough. These people, for these people, it wasn't enough either. They're still looking for someone else. They're saying, uh, when the Christ comes, is he going to be as cool as this guy? We believe in him, though, whatever he is and whoever he is. Remember, the scripture actually says that there are going to be people on Judgment Day who say, hey, didn't we, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and this in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. So there's a difference between kind of knowing Jesus casually or knowing of him acknowledging him, thinking he was great in a number of different areas, and knowing that he's Lord of lords and King of kings, knowing that he's God Almighty in the flesh, knowing that he, the Father and the Spirit, are eternally one God in three persons, and that we are creations, uh, image bearers of God, and that it is our complete and ultimate destiny to be conformed to the image of Jesus, that there is no hope in this world or in the next without Jesus, that he is the only Lord and Savior that we can cling to, to see our sins forgiven, to see our sicknesses healed, to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have a destiny and a purpose and a plan in this life. No, it's only through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That's the kind of passion and the knowledge, the knowing of Jesus that I think he's wanting us to have. So, that is our purpose, Valley Christian Church, to know Jesus and make him known. Amen. And right now we're engaged in that. We're getting to know him better as we look in his word. But we don't want to be like those who, who kind of know Jesus, who believe, who mentally assent to the fact that he is who he was, but he's not Lord in their lives. Let's see what else is going on here. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. And then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, again the Jewish leaders, religious leaders, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? In other words, is he going to spread out and get out of Dodge, leave Israel? Is he going to go up to Macedonia? Is he going to just, I don't know, go to Athens? What's he going to do? Is he going to go be with the Greeks or something? What does he mean when he says, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? So he kind of is a low profile again for a little bit, but it's on the last day, the great day of this particular feast. Uh, I guess as some scholars say this would have been the seventh day, but most say, no, it would have been an eighth day. And we know eight in the scripture is the number of new beginnings because um, I think that's when, uh, that's when babies, baby boys were circumcised. Only boys, right? Baby boys were circumcised and welcomed into the covenant of Israel. Eight beginning, obviously, is a brand new baby, but uh, seven is the, is the cycle that God instituted from the very beginning, a seven-day cycle. So when you talk about an eighth day, you're really talking about a brand new thing that hasn't been seen before. And in this instance, um, this is probably the eighth day of this particular feast. And when this time comes, there's a ceremony that happens where several priests take golden, vase, va uh, uh, golden pitchers. They go to the Pool of Siloam in kind of a procession. They scoop some water in there. And then there's also another pitcher with wine in it, apparently. And then they kind of celebrate as they go to uh, a place near the temple and I think it's near the altar, one of the altars anyway. And one priest on one side takes that water and pours it out as an offering. And then they pour out wine on the other side. And um, there is this, uh, this sense that, that the water represents the Holy Spirit. And they're not sure what the wine represents, maybe the joy of God. And, and it's a celebration and people are supposed to be praising God and having a great time. And, and even then, they, they recognize that as a symbol of the Holy Spirit, the, the water. 
Uh, there's a scripture that says, therefore, with joy shall we draw water out of the, out of the wells of salvation. So even in, in the Jewish mindset, they had a, an understanding of the Ruach HaKodesh, which is the Hebrew way of saying the Holy Spirit. And they, they loved and appreciated without understanding exactly who the Holy Spirit was. Uh, they, they recognized that there was a need for the Spirit of God and that he was the one who would anoint the prophets and anoint the kings and anoint the priests to be able to do what they were supposed to do. So, um, so they celebrated that. But Jesus, in the midst of this, he stands up in verse 37 and starts to scream or crying out. So he wants people to hear this. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then John comments in verse 39, but this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So imagine this. While these priests are, are doing this ceremony on the eighth day, the day of new beginnings, water out of a beautiful vessel is being poured by an altar and wine is being poured by the other. Doesn't it remind you of some things? Doesn't it remind you that at the ultimate altar of sacrifice, the cross, Jesus the Lord would die for us and out of him would come both water and blood coming out of his side, out of where his heart was. When the soldier pierced that pericardial sac, I think they call it, out came the serum and the, the coagulated blood. But to John, he was saying blood and water spilled out. And here in this particular feast, there is wine, red wine, and there's water from this from this uh, particular pool, Siloam, which actually means scent. So there's all these tupasas, right? All these types and shadows. No wonder Jesus was crying out like he was a cry in his voice and a cry and maybe tears in his eyes. And he's like, I'm the one that's going to be poured out at the ultimate sacrificial altar. My, my blood and, and, the, and, and the blood and water is going to burst forth from my heart. And it's going to be a, a, a symbol of, of things to come. The sacrifice that I did is going to open the way for the, for the water of the Holy Spirit to become like a, a living fountain within the hearts and minds of everybody who receives me. Everyone who receives that sacrifice of, of, of precious, holy, sinless blood is going to get the water too. It's going to get the Holy Spirit because it's in his sacrifice that he was glorified. And in his resurrection, one of the last things Jesus does, remember, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And of course, we know what happened in Acts chapter 2, because we just studied that in Pentecost Sunday, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, uh, and the disciples were all gathered together in one accord, all 120 of them. There came a sound as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and then there appeared to them uh, cloven tongues as of fire, and it sat on each of them, and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It just flowed out of them like water. Jesus was telling the truth. And he was glorified in that the church was born in that moment. And in just a few minutes time, 3,000 more people got saved and were added to that church. And not too long later, another 5,000. And the church just exploded into being. It was like the eighth day, the new beginning, the, the, the outpouring of the Spirit. The pouring of the blood of Jesus made way for the pouring of the water of the Spirit. So incredible, all kinds of cool things that we can talk about in that. Um, boy, there's so much more that I could say here, but I'm not actually here right now. You think that I'm here at Valley Christian Church, but this is pre-recorded. You know where I am right now? I'm in Bemidji, or Burmidji, as some people say, with my family. It's, I, I really owe my family a vacation so much. I mean, I spent so many hours um, doing uh, these online Bible studies and sermons, and it's incredible how much time it takes to do this stuff. And so I, uh, we're in Bemidji right now. So I'm going to just say we're done at this point and cut it a little bit short so I can get back into the lake or whatever it is I'm doing at the moment. 
and uh, and say God bless you. I'm going to pray for you, and then we're con going to conclude today a little bit shorter, only 24 minutes. But I spoke really fast, so I feel like I I rolled 60 minutes and compressed it into 24. And you can watch it again and turn the sound you know on halfway half speed so you can slow me down and understand me. I didn't even have that much coffee either, so so let's pray. And we'll be done with the Bible study for this Thursday. And we will plan on meeting, God willing, next uh, Thursday, a week from today. And uh, meeting in person, but not too in person. And you can also watch right here next Thursday, even though we'll be meeting in person. We're going to stream it live so that everybody can, can be a part. Father, I thank you for this beautiful group of people. I ask your special blessing on them. Whatever their issues are right now, I pray that you would meet them right where they are. I ask, Lord, that your spirit, the, the water of your spirit will refresh them. They're feeling down. They're feeling bad. I pray that your water will be like, just like water to their souls, like water to their spirits, water, even a sense of refreshment to their physical body. I pray that you'll minister to them in the name of Jesus. And whatever they're worried about, I pray that your peace will come upon them right now. Whatever they're struggling with, I pray that you will lift the heavy burden off of them. Um, anything that they are sick from, I pray that you will heal them. I break the power of sickness over them right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Father God, that you will bless them like they've never been blessed. I ask, Lord, that you will use them to reach other people with the gospel of Jesus. Fill their hearts and minds with a good theme, like your word says. And I pray that they would be about your business each and every day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in today for this compressed Bible study. But uh, we'll see you next Thursday in person or here online once again. I bless you in Jesus' name. Bye-bye.